Uh, hi, everyone. In the fourth part of this lecture series, we'll continue on uh, some estimators and uh, move on to some open problems in the uh, derivations of these. That I hand it over. Uh, just as a reminder, this talk is being recorded. Hope that you Yeah. Okay. So. Yeah. So I guess it's been a long gap. Uh, so what I'll do is uh, I'll do some recap, and then I'll start with uh, estimators for individual treatment effect because that has the counterfactual paper. Uh, so I'm going to discuss two papers. OK, so both of them have been very recent, like uh, 2000, post-2017. Uh, so if you were to write a new paper on uh, individual treatment effect estimation, most likely you might have to come back to these two as basements. <laughs> let's, let's put it that way. OK, so I'll cover uh, some sort of a proof uh, technique for uh, uh, performance of one of the estimators. Uh, but I have made a lot of assumptions, but uh, there's a very interesting message there. So I want to first uh, do that. And then the second estimator, if there is time, I'll go into some proofs. If not, I'll just state what the estimator looks like. That goes into neural net territory. So you, you can see that in this particular talk, uh, you're sort of connecting uh, the requirements of causal inference to sort of the familiar world in supervised learning, which is regression, um, maybe using maybe regression using very fancy neural nets and other function classes. Okay, so that's what we are going to talk about today. So let me just do a small recap. Right, so we actually looked at the potential outcome model. And uh, we discussed what uh, ignorability means. Right? It is some version of no confounding. So if you are given treatment data, basically how do you do average treatment effect estimation? So under ignorability, we basically said we could reduce to a bunch of estimators. Uh, so we basically discussed IBW, standardization, even in IPW there were uh, many versions. So we also discussed the high estimator. Had very nice variance control properties. And the fourth, last time we saw how doubly robust estimator uh, sort of gets the best of both worlds. You, you, you only need to have a consistent regressor or you need to have a consistent classifier that estimates over a consistent score. Okay. So this is what so far that we have seen. Um, and I also derived some finite sample guarantees for. Uh, so IPW finite sample guarantees, right? Using median of means. Other estimators that you could use, like clipped estimators and all that, I didn't get into it. Just wanted to show one where you can get some guarantee. Uh, then I showed you how in the limit, if one of them is consistent, meaning the propensity score estimation or the regression is consistent, the W robust estimator would be consistent. Therefore, the name W robust, right? Uh, then I said, okay, this is all for average treatment effect. Now we'll actually go to individual treatment effect, right? And then I said a few things in the last lecture at the end of the lecture. So I'll start with that. And then let's go to two uh, very famous, at least by now very famous, uh, papers in this space, right? Okay, so this is the recap. Uh, I think I'll erase this and write over it again just to make it simple. Okay, so we have our usual table just to recall for everyone. So you have some observed features, some treatment, and uh, you have Y and you have y1 and you have y0. Uh, so these are the potential outcomes not observed. Similarly, you have all other features which are in the exogenous variable. This is also not observed. The only things that are observed are xt and y. 
and the consistent property says that if the treatment is one, you basically put one or the other. T was equal to one. Use this. T was equal to zero. It basically is. Right. So you have a table like this. And uh, we assumed uh, ignorability. Again, recall y1 and y0 is independent of t given x. Uh, we discussed various conditions under which this could be true. I, I'm going to go more into this once I introduce Perlian approaches to causality. So it actually tries to tell you when this can be true or not. Right? But for now, this is one assumption. And the second one is that uh, for every person, the probability of treatment is always positive no matter what the treatment is. Right, so for all T M one, you know one. This is a positivity assumption. There are a few other assumptions, but the most important ones are these two. Right. Uh, now I wanted to talk about individual treatment effect. So you can define individual treatment effect to be the expected value of y1 of uh, of x conditioned on x is equal to x by t the person was not treated right so you would like to estimate this i mean it's a part of the individual treatment effect of course if the person was not treated you would like to know what would happen if the person was treated this way right now immediately applying uh, the ignorability right uh, we basically argued last time uh, that if you use ignorability and the consistency, actually this boils down to expected value of y given x is equal to x comma t is equal to one okay, plus positive equation. Okay. So consistency is mostly uh, given from the table. Uh, the definition of potential outcomes is intimately tied with consistency. So all we have said is under ignorability and positivity, I am looking at the people who have not been treated. And I'm asking only for those people, what would happen if you treat, right? That's my question. This is not available at all because I'm systematically looking at the cases where T is equal to zero. Therefore, Y1 is completely used, right? And in that, I'm conditioning on some X and I'm trying to ask for the conditional expectation, right? But what we showed is that under ignorability, this is actually nothing but y given x is equal to x given uh, in comma t is equal to 1. Right? This is what we showed. Because we already know that uh, this is equal to the expected value of y1 of x, condition on x is equal to x. And uh, due to previous lectures, we basically connected these two. We just said it's a regression process. Right? So what you're trying to do is that in order to, so in order to get treatment effect, what, what should you do for the for the for the people who have not been treated? You have to take the expected value of y1 of x minus y0 of x, condition on x is equal to x, comma t is equal to zero. This is what you need actually, right? Because you're looking at people who have not been treated, uh, y will Try to do a regression and then basically substitute. And as long as positivity is satisfied, this would be a good estimate. So that's what that's the story. That's what so far I've said. So the question is, of course, uh, here there's already a distribution shift problem that is being implied because there are two types of people: control and treatment. But if I want to get y1 of x for the person who has not been treated, I need to go to the other one. That's exactly what the equation is saying. Okay. One simplest way of doing this is the following. You go to the person who has been treated, you go to the group that has been treated, look for the nearest neighbor of X, just substitute that over here. It's like the simplest estimator we can think of. Is that estimator always zero? Sorry, the right side. Expectation of Y1 of X minus Y0 of X. No, no, this is the uh, individual treatment effect. This is not zero. Uh, in fact, these two are independent given x. So essentially, you really don't care what this what this is, whether the person is treated or not. But I'm just writing it so that uh, I'm just telling you that only one part is available. The other part is being obtained after regressing on some other data. 
So the point I'm trying to make here is there is control t is equal to zero, right? And you have all the y's, but essentially they are y zeros. And you have treatments, and essentially they are y ones, right? So what I'm trying to say is that if I have an x, I need to find out y one here. Just saying, just go here, do a regression. And basically, for this x, try to find out what the regression gives you and substitute here. That's what I'm trying to say. That's what this says. Okay, so for the first sentence, mm -hmm. expectation of y1 of x given x equal to x equals 20 equal to 0 is equal to expectation of y0 of x given x equal to x and t. No, that's not the way. Now. I'm looking at y1 of x, right? The only thing you can apply is ignorability here. You can't change what you want to estimate. So, this, so I'm, I'm interested in the counterfactual. The counterfactual doesn't change. Only that what we are saying is it's equivalent to estimating it without the conditioning under ignorability and product. Right? And that uh, again is equivalent to the regression from consistency and all that. So this was denied, this was this was derived in previous lectures. If you look at the notes from the This was already done. Yes, sorry. Uh, sorry for the confusion, yes, sir. Uh, just uh, one last point. Maybe positivity is not required. Uh, you need that in almost all the steps. I'm just uh, I'm just recalling it. So I'm not telling you which step means what and all that. But this certainly needs ignorability. But from here, if you want to go to here, you are actually changing distribution. So clearly, you need positivity. Because if there are people who could potentially never have been treated, probabilistically speaking, uh, then this translation is just not possible. So if you went from here to here, you would have definitely used uh, positive. Why? Because you would use a consistency equation, which is uh, y1 is nothing but uh, t times y, right? Uh, under uh, plus one max. So y1 is t times y, actually. Whenever t is equal to uh, one, this will be so y1 times t is equal to t times y. So that's what you would use, actually. Right? Uh, so what I'm trying to say here is that in order to go from here to here, you would use consistency first, move to y, and then you would again do another conditioning, and then and then first of all claim that this conditional distribution holds for the same x. It will hold only if positivity is satisfied. Because you're looking at an individual in the control group. Factually, the person has not been treated. But my propensity score says there is always a non zero propensity of assigning that person both the treatments. And I know that, for example. Yeah. So the reason I ask is because the counterfactual does not exist on this, right? So, yes. so that means that positivity is not there. It's not that the counterfactual does not exist. The counterfactual always exists. These are imaginary columns. The only question is whether you can estimate it from whatever you have been given or not. I'm just saying that under positivity plus ignorability, only then you can have placed. Right. So this one definitely is ignorability, but the other step involves all three in some, in some form or the other. Now, anyway, let's come back to this uh, equation. So let's call this individual treatment effect. So by the way, that doesn't depend on t equal to zero by ignorability. Uh, so we'll define this to be the ID. And we would like to have estimators for this. That's our interest. Okay, so I already said the first conditional distribution can be estimated by doing a regression on only one of the uh, groups. And the second one can be estimated by doing regression on the other group. So you just have to subtract, right? This is the simplest estimator you can think of. Uh, and uh, it has a name. It's called the T-learner. So what it says is that you want an estimate for y1, so you will call it uh, mu1 hat of x. This is an estimator for uh, this uh, y1 of x. This can be obtained by regressing uh, x on y for the treatment group. Okay. So then you have mu hat 0 of x. And then you again regress x on y back for the control. 
So a simplest estimator is you just take mu one hat of x minus mu hat of uh, mu uh, mu hat of zero of x, and then you just uh, get that estimator. Okay, it's the simplest estimator. It has a name. It's called t-learner. Uh, so I am. Uh, so a lot of what I'm going to say today is from this paper called Meta Learner. Actually. Yeah, I'm just searching for the title of it. <laughs> okay, so meta learner for homogeneous, I mean heterogeneous treatment effects uh, by by being you. I mean, one of the others is being you. So meta learners for heterogeneous treatment effect estimation. So PNAS paper. I don't remember exactly uh, when it got accepted and all that, but I think uh, the latest version is in archive, 2019, uh, and uh, one of some of the co-authors are bigger like than you. Okay. So the first thing they propose is T-learner, which is very obvious, nothing complicated here. However, there is a very interesting and subtle point. The point is the following. So I care only about ID. Right? I only care about the difference in the estimator. Right? The individual treatment, okay, sorry, individual response functions, y1 of x and y0 of x might be very complex. But the difference may not be that complex. Okay? If that is the case, can you come up with some estimation procedure which will gracefully scale? So here, suppose, uh, for example, yeah, I did some uh, regression on Lipschitz functions, for example. And then there's some parametric rate that is possible. So it's known in statistics. I'm not going to go into all of that, but it's not one over n. Your own samples there won't go back, go as one over n. That, that won't happen. Okay. So it'll go as one over n power two by three or something like that. It's known in the limit, it is achieved by K and N estimators. Okay, but that's not important. What's important is that if I only have Lipschitz functions, if I need an estimate for this, there are estimators, but it won't go at one over n. But what the difference between y1 of x and y0 of x is actually simple. Maybe tau of x is actually a simpler function, but y1 of x and y0 of x are more complex functions. Okay. The question then is, can you design some interesting estimates which can exploit the fact that the final estimate is actually going to be simple, although I need to spend time to estimate uh, these things, for example. Okay. Okay, let me let me do that. Yes, just do that. Rahul, can I write on this? Yes. Yeah. Also, in that HD, what does the progenius mean? Uh, I mean, heterogeneous treatment simply means that. Uh, okay, so it's a word that's used uh, if you have multiple treatments. Actually, but we will only consider binary treatments. Yeah. Yeah. I think uh, treatment here we are considered to be a scalar, but it could be a vector. Vector treatments, I don't know. Which which means, like, like, uh, multiple treatments can be vectors. Yeah, I mean there are generalizations of this. Some of them might fold, some of them might not fold. But it's very difficult to say which one will hold, which one will not fold. Actually, at the point. But a lot of these things, so far, whatever I've written will work, but the estimators, I don't know if it will work. Yes. It can be no a priori whether the uh, treatment is simpler function than uh, the regressor section. No, no, I'm not talking about treatment being simple. I'm just saying the individual treatment effect that you are seeking is simple, but each one of the response functions is very complicated. See, the point is. Uh, let's say I want to know uh, what happens uh, to your blood pressure level if I give you a specific drug, right? Maybe the normal response function with respect to different set of features is already very complicated. But maybe all that a drug does is basically do a shift. That could very well happen. Now, what I do not want, because what this is saying is that you go and, I mean, basically estimate is very complicated AV function for the first uh, treatment uh, group. And another way we complicated function for the control group, and then you subtract them together, and you will incur both. Ways. I mean, you cannot. Uh, I mean, the variance will be additive. Basically, there's nothing else you can do. 
So if you are basically inheriting the regression uh, uh, error of the estimation step, which is which is used to estimate one of the responses. So what I'm asking is, if I knew that the difference is going to be simple, for example, in some sense, I, I formally make it uh, what would be the wrong simple. Uh, then can you actually do something? So we'll make two assumptions. Okay, so we yeah. When you say regression, I just want to understand the meaning of your word. So here, expected value of y given uh, x equals x, that will be some deterministic function of x. Okay. So is that function what you are trying to find? Yes, or that's the function. You said regress x on y, so I'm a bit confused. Oh, sorry, uh, what I meant. Y on x, y on, sorry. So this mean expected value of y given x. Y given x for this group, expected value of y given x for that group, MMSC estimators. So the key question that's answered in this meta learner paper, by the way, uh, all these meta, all these meta learners that I'm going to talk about is actually implemented in most projects. So it's a very important baseline. So if you are able to do some open problem over here, this is something that you would like to talk about. But this is a bit agnostic to which regressor you're using. It's more like how do I combine different cells for different quantities in a way so that I can actually reduce my estimation error. That is what they're going for. Uh, it's not really a question about oh, you should use random forest or HG push. I mean, you can use whatever you want. The base learner can be. In this case, the base learner is used for estimating mu hat and mu zero. That's all I've said so far. So, for example, to concretely, you can take a neural net, estimate. This one for the group one using least squares loss, and uh, this for group two, like which is the control group for least squares loss. Take the estimate, take the difference, and that would be right. So okay, right now, yes. I have a functional assumption. Yeah. Do I still make positivity? The fact that this has to be equal to this cannot hold if you don't have one. Right, because if this person is not ever going to be treated at all, there's just no way from the data that you obtain you could ever figure out what, uh, which basically means you're also not treating people who are like me. That's what it means. And there's nobody in my neighborhood who has ever received a treatment. Then how are you going to estimate what my Y1 is? Because I have an assumption that X, F, or I, the functional assumption. I can extrapolate. Okay, you could extrapolate. This assumption is needed to basically say that whatever your regression you're doing, extrapolation that you're doing, with these assumptions, I can at least say what the error is per, per, per point. But then if you're taking one person, one blob outside, and that is only treated, which means P of T is equal to zero is one for those people. It means any nearest neighbor over there is also never going to be treated. So for that, I will never be able to subtract. I mean, you might be able to regress here, but the extrapolation could be anything. I mean, you could just extrapolate using whatever. I mean, depending on the function class, you really can extrapolate. And I can't say anything about the consistency of that. So that's why we are being very careful, at least uh, from a theoretical point of view, in saying that positivity is required. Okay, in practice, what should you do? You should just apply this. <laughs> I am not uh, disputing that part here. Right? And we will come to your question in the second uh, I think there's one more interesting uh, uh, estimator that was proposed based on neural text. And that roughly, see, I mean, it won't solve the support problem. See, if you don't have support overlap, there's nothing you can do. You can only make claims about people who are in the common support. That I said even in the first class. I said uh, the IPW estimator, if you remember, one of the high X estimator, uh, if the support is not there, I derived a slightly modified version. So that's all you can do. I don't think you can say anything in general. Because this is an extrapolation problem. And it could be anything. Yeah. So, how would you define model complexity for non? So, I understand for linear regressors, it's degrees of the polynomial. Uh, but for more complex functions, yeah. Have to yeah. So, just one second. I just want to state the rates correctly. <laughs>
Okay. Okay. So let's actually look at one of the functions, mu naught of x, right? So you are trying to uh, estimate mu naught x using some least squares uh, estimator. Suppose you have m. So let's let's have Assume that we have M control samples. We have N uh, treatments. Okay, if everything is linear, so I mean, this is enough statistics. I'm not going to prove uh, each one of them separately, but I'm going to show a more meta result, which is what is important because that's what the name meta actually indicates. Uh, yeah. It's for a pitch text or this is like for all x's combined you are trying to control samples. Yeah, for all x combined, I have control samples. Okay. So usually uh, the MMSC error that you are interested in will be mu naught of x minus uh, y1 of x. Right. So this is what you are uh, usually interested in. And you are interested in over some class of estimators. Okay. Now, suppose I mean I have made some assumptions. I'm making those assumptions. So suppose y1 of x is actually nothing but uh, let's say some function. Uh, sorry, f1 of x plus uh, epsilon. Uh, so let's say xi, xi, epsilon i. All I'm saying saying is for the ith person, suppose the potential outcome is some function of the covariates plus some independent parts. Suppose this was the case, right? Uh, th this means nothing about the world. <laughs> All I have said simply is the y1 of x can be written in this way. I mean, epsilon i is independent from different people. That's all I have said. I haven't said anything else. Right? I have talked about u and all that. Ignorability takes care of it. All I'm saying is some unknown noise. Right? Now, um, uh, uh, one more interesting uh, uh, thing is that suppose f is Lipschitz. Shifts in the infinity, just to be safe, right? Uh, then I think what you can prove uh, is that the the best estimator, the minimax rate for this estimator uh, for this family would actually scale roughly as one over uh, this is mu naught, so they have m control sample, so m power two by two, roughly. This is known in statistics. I'm not going to prove this to you, okay? But the interesting uh, claim is that uh, you can actually uh, obtain this uh, using KNM based estimators. If you really want to prove what it is. Okay. But if I had, yes. Did you mean u0 hat x minus y0 x? Yes, sorry. Potential. Yeah. Okay, sure. Right? Now, but suppose F is linear, then the minimax uh, optimal, uh, I mean, uh, ordinary e squares actually has a, 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 a you can get this. There's a D word, but uh, just uh, writing of the D and all that, so you get one over it. Right? So it's a square error, right? Uh, so you get one over it. This is possible. So the question really is, if I have an estimator for mu that is of this kind, but potentially if you give me targets, tau of x is linear, which means potentially I can actually get a weight of 1 over m. What is that integrate? That's my question, which I'll answer. Okay. And uh, you will also see how the control treatment and how one group's stuff can be used for the estimation of the other group. But you won't pay for it in some sense. So we will actually. Talk. So by example, if I use this estimator, right? What what would you what would you pay? You would pay one over m power two by three plus one over n power two by three. Now the question I'm asking you is that for it, can you get better than this? Yes. Uh, maybe uh, I'm just asking for clarification. Therefore, linear is better than here. Yeah, I mean no no. This is a different function class, right? So here you have Lipschitz functions. 
So if you had Lipschitz functions and you're trying to do regression, I'm saying you can't get one over M rate. That's all I'm trying to say in general. Okay. But if you have linear functions, you can get one over M rate. So the hypothesis class is given to be linear. No, so uh, I'm just merely saying if the hypothesis class is this, you cannot get one over M rate, you'll get something like this. If you have linear, you can actually get one over M. But what this learner is saying is that you will have to pay the worst of both. Even if this was simple, it doesn't matter. If you use T learner, you will actually have to pay one over M to the one. Two. Right? So what I'm going to assume is that there is some uh, estimator class that you could estimate. And for all the samples that are given to you, uh, the the error, uh, the expected why you put expectations here, conditioned on the fact. So it was order later. So all I'm going to say is let's just let me just assume point wise there is some estimator which has an error rate of one over power. Ideally, we want an estimator which is order of one by m plus n. One by m plus one by n. I mean, I don't think you one by m plus n. But one over n. I don't think that's possible. What I can tell you, what I can assure you, is that you might get one over m power a plus one over n. Now you get one over m power a plus one over n power a because I insist on using the same complicated estimator class for the other. See, this Lipschitzness is an example. The result I'm going to give you is agnostic to the class. Okay, I'm just going to motivate why you need something more complicated than just regressing. Because the theory says you just need to regress. So why don't you just regress and subtract? Right? Of course, you would do well. But the point is that uh, there's a subtlety here. If the difference was simple, you are probably hurting yourself. And that's all I'm trying to solve here. That's it. And this repeats for my understanding. Without this T learner, yeah. what you would have is uh, uh, you will have order of max of one over n to the two by three, yeah. comma one by n to the two by three. And now somehow you're going to show us that. No, it will be the sum actually, because here I incur and here I incur. Both, therefore, I will. Which is order of the worst. Yeah, what yeah. the maximum. Uh, and now you're going to show us that you can. Yeah, you can do straight here. Okay, so before we go there, let's introduce one more type of learner called S learner. This is just more like an FYI. <laughs> it's not that it doesn't mean anything uh, very complicated. So the second uh, proposal was you have what is called an S learner. And S learner says, why do two different regressions? Uh, just take the data Y and just simply regress on X comma T. Uh, and then uh, just have two is uh, one estimator and then evaluate them on both. Uh, the treatment and the out, the treatment and the control, right? And you can form an estimate of lengths. I mean, there's nothing complicated I'm saying. It's just that put one regression. That's all I'm saying. But still, this will incur the same issues as what I've said. Now, the third estimator is the most interesting one, which I promised that somehow the best of both worlds, right? So let me do that. Uh, okay, the proof is a bit uh, involved and complicated. It's just more notation. I'll just make it slightly simpler so that I convey the main point and you guys can see why it is what it is. Right? Uh, so I'll make some assumptions in writing it in a simpler manner. But if you guys really want, I will just make it everything from the cover. Okay. So, okay, just what is it? S learner is uh, instead of two different regressors, you can just directly regress on X comma T and then just put. Uh, what does S stand for? Uh, I don't know why it is called S learner. <laughs> Before look at the paper, but it's called S. Yeah. Why did you say that will have the same issue as with this? Uh, yes, so the issue now here, so I don't know the rates for S learner. Uh, it's a bit difficult to say because the only co only thing that's changing is the coordinate t. So you may be right that you might get some benefit of both m plus n. So you might get one by m plus n. True, that's possible. But it's not very clear. Okay. Because the only thing I'm doing is I'm just switching one coordinate and getting one expression and another coordinate and getting another expression. So it's not at all very clear. But you're right, you will get some benefit. 
but XLR will give you a faster benefit. But here again, the main point to note is that you will not escape the scaling. If it's one over m power a, but both m and n are order wise the same things, you are still going to never get the linear break. You are going to get some sublinear break. So that that you cannot say uh, from around, right? But what I'm going to propose next, hopefully, would would, would save that. Okay. So that's called the XLR curve. So let me go there. Uh, by the way, in uh, any given practical problem, nobody knows which one of them will work better. <laughs> you just have to try it. Okay. So this is just. Uh, uh, I mean, a theory that can justify why such different estimators are proposed. It is one to make that really. I want to change anything in empirical methods. Should I write here or here? So, if you were to guess, what do you think the X, okay, it's called X learner? Called a hybrid learner. So it's a hybrid between P and S, right? So if you want to guess what you think uh, you would do, right? So first of all, I said that y1 minus y0 of x, uh, if you could come up with a target, okay, then I could do linear regression because I know that this is of the form x times b. Uh, and uh, here v is d cross one, sorry, yeah, d cross one. This is one cross three. So I'm writing it in the row way. So the data is all rows. I mean, you get it with b, and you get this. Okay. So the true, uh, I mean, in fact, you can just write expected value because if there's noise and all that, you can get it up to. So this is the assumption I'm going to make. So clearly, I have at some point I need to do uh, linear regression. The only question is how do I construct targets? So the obvious way to combine both is very simple. You take the T-learner, apply it on both groups. You actually get mu naught of mu naught of x and uh, mu one hat of x. They have their own problems like estimation errors. So then what you do is you take the treatment group. For y1, these are the new targets I'll form. Y1 minus new naught of x. Then you take uh, so for the case of so control doesn't be the y1. So, so you accept this, you do mu one hat minus y one. Now what you do, uh, you actually do a division. Doesn't have y1. So did you mean u1 have minus y0 for treatment? Treatment group doesn't have y1, right? Treatment has y1, right? You take the expert T learner, plug it in here. So it doesn't so you plug the other one. This feature so how is this point B? Okay, there's a little bit of Yeah, I mean, so you divide the samples into half. Okay, let me be very clear. M by C. So you take M by 2, N by 2 samples for this step, and do M by 2, N by 2 samples for this step. I mean, practice you will let it overlap, but for theory, I guess I need some independence, so uh, I just assume it's just a factor of two of it. It doesn't change the scale. Okay, so this is called the XLR. Okay, now uh, even in this XLR nut, you'll be a bit careful. You can be a bit more pedantic and say that this is a bunch of targets, but only for treatment. So I learned beta naught. This is a bunch of targets, but for control. I learn beta one. And then what I'll do is I'll do a convex combination of both. If both of them are consistent, the convex combination has to be consistent. So what you can do is you can do one minus g of x times beta naught plus uh, beta one times g of x. 
in their paper they said this is the final estimate and that's very interesting properties now i'm going to show that yeah why don't use s planner for this you can use s planner for the second part i don't doesn't affect you in many ways but uh, this has some interesting properties i'll come to what is g g is any mixture uh, the general uh, there is a recommendation used to is to put uh, the propensity itself as this so basically if you are here you put the b not uh, b not because you will be in distribution if you are this you put b1 that's it this is very simple like that way you don't uh, you don't have any extrapolation issue at least in this time okay now i'm going to argue that let's take systematically g to be one The, okay, so this is theory. So, so formal thing. Okay. I'm going to assume G is equal to one. But what am I doing, right? So what doing? What is it trying to do? So B one was actually estimated slowly. Okay, so I think I messed up the zero and the one. So I This is uh, this is this is zero. G to be zero. Okay. So, G estimate G uh, the final. So this would be one G times B one plus B times B. G, but it's okay. So all I'm going to say is if it comes from treatment, it's called one. If it comes from control, it's called zero. That's what I'm trying to say. Now let's say take G to be zero. Okay, so you have B1. Okay. B1, look at B1. B1 has targets did not come from this group. The B1 has targets actually came from the control group. The mu X actually did not come from here. It actually came from the control. Right? So here you don't need to split M by two, N by two. You can just use M and N. Right? And I want to show. For this particular uh, case of estimator, uh, even if mu has this rate and uh, the other rate is linear, you are going to get uh, 1 over m power a plus 1 over n. This is the final level. You used to get 1 over m power a plus 1 over m power a or worse 1 over m plus m power a or something. But here you still get the linear rate. So you could say if, if the people who are being treated are actually, so now you can trade off. If the people who are control or more, but the treated are less, you would have to go with this kind of knowledge. You would not be doing two, 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 two regressions. You would actually take regression from one, create targets, and just directly estimate all this. I mean, it's very intuitive, uh, but it's just that uh, there are also proposals of this form and they're very concrete here. Yeah. Yes. But in some regimes, but the main point I'm trying to make is that uh, it's linear at least in one of them. So the more complicated case usually is the law of control, very few treatments. That's usually the practical case. Very few treatments because treatments are expensive, so naturally uh, very few treatments. N is small, M is very large. Okay. Now, if you do this, for example, so but uh, let's say uh, M power A and N are comparable, just for the sake of argument. Just one question. Yes. Can we interchange and have it as one over N? Plus one over yeah, if you do the g equal to one, you will get that. so that's not what I'm for. Yeah, and maybe there's some interpolation that's better also, uh, but that's very difficult to analyze. So we will just analyze the n case, right? So here, what's happening here is suppose n power a is equal to n, so a is less than one, better. So a is always less than one, right? Suppose uh, you know n power a is equal to n. Otherwise, you have lesser numbers. Then this would be a sticky event. Because in the other case, n is so small, so you would get 1 over 2 times n power a. Basically, that's all you get. Uh, here, you will actually get 1 over 2 plus 1 over n power a. Which is strictly better. Okay, so, you said uh, what if you can compare with the 
test learn. Even then, in some regimes, you will get benefits with all of time. So. That is not obvious because the S planner, I thought it will be 1 over n plus n to the power a. So even if m is like, I, I presume you are assuming m is like n square. Right? m is n square, yes. Right? So 1 plus m plus n to the power a still looks better than this. Oh, I see. So you're saying that, uh, okay, so in some regimes, maybe it is better. Okay. But the main point here is that uh, it's not very easy to argue because the only thing I'm changing is 1 and 0. So it's not very clear what the error would actually look like. It's not very clear. Enough. See, because this one, right, cannot suddenly get a power from the other uh, set. Because mu hat of x comma 1 can only depend on the treatment. And the mu hat of x comma 0 can only depend on x comma 0. Just because they added an extra coordinate does not imply that suddenly you will get some magical extrapolatory power. That's all I'm trying to say. So most likely this won't be 1 on our plus n, but that would be a very optimistic estimate for the range. Uh, in that regime, can you uh, copy the mixture like G? Yeah, I guess you can. Maybe you can get uh, something more. And then you're saying the optima will be at the vertices, so therefore you can produce. No, 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 no. I, I'm, I'm not saying anything. Else. No, I don't think anything else. Because uh, G of X is itself a function. So you have, you have to optimize over function classes. So I have no idea what is the best function class that you can have. What they suggest is simply uh, use a propensity. Like if it is in this group, you use this. If you use in that group, you use B1. And then you will get a better estimate. That's all I'm saying one of the groups actually has this thing. That's what I want. Okay, the proof is actually very simple. But I just make a lot of assumptions to just show you uh, where exactly the magic is happening. Okay. You must have already guessed it by now, but let me just uh, let me just formally do it. Let's say some equal zero cases. what complete. This is the case. So for this case, you get this. So here I'm using, uh, okay, I'm always going to say G is equal to zero. G is equal to zero. Okay. So say G is equal to zero, you use the complicated estimator on the control and you create targets and you do simple linear regression on the treated. So the simple linear regression rate is one over M, the other thing is one over M. That's all. One second. Oh, sorry, maybe quite a It is also a really not fun to be literature. Uh, we don't specify what class it is. I only motivated uh, the literature case. I'm just going to assume that there is some regression class where you can get M today. And that regressor is available. That's all I'm trying to say. Uh, so it's not going to really depend on any specific regressor class. Okay. So let's assume that the expected value of mu naught of x times y naught of x uh, squared conditioned on the fact that uh, the number of uh, treatment assignments, let me just put t. The number of treatment assignments is exactly equal to n. This is sort of important because you use this x to slot these people into a treated category. So the x that came here is not marginal distribution anymore. It is some other distribution, right? So you have to be very careful uh, in trying to actually make only conditional statements. So all I'm saying is I have observed a bunch of data. I know that n of them are treated. So conditioned on that, I'm assuming there is some regressor that for per point in my data set will actually give me an expected error of uh, C naught divided by n power A. It's a lot of assumptions because I'm taking per X. This expectation is over other numbers. That doesn't include X. So this is for all X. In the for all X. Size the treatment group having size. I mean, it's okay. It's either, so it's either of them is yeah. uh, But will your error not be of the order of the worst point in the group? So, why is summing 
sufficient and you don't have to consider the individual uh, treatment type each time. No, I didn't answer. Uh, so here we are not considering uh, how many data points we have per X. Per um, X belongs to it. No, usually it's a continuous variable. So for every X, you will have a separate uh, entry, right? Yes. I'm just saying there's some regressor that over my data sets will sort of get. So uh, let me repeat the question. Yeah. So you have any end treatment samples. Yeah. And we have not specified how those end treatment samples are distributed over each X. Yes. Does that not matter? So that's what uh, let me actually present uh, the generative one. Coming, right. So P is Bernoulli. Of some P. Okay. This is how M, M plus N samples are uh, generated. Okay, so T is Bernoulli over T. Uh, then Y1 of X, as I said, was actually mu 1 of X plus noise. But I call it epsilon 1 of I. The reason is that uh, depending on which one it is, you substitute the other or, the, or this. So mu 0 of X and epsilon 0 of I. Uh, and you have the normal consistency equation uh, that I won't write. So this is the generative model. So here what you do is that you M plus N samples, you actually generate according to this uh, thing. And OK, Y is equal to uh, T times Y1 plus 1 minus T times Y0. This is a full generative model of the entire data. OK, under this, uh, what I'm trying to say is you condition on the fact that your N treatment samples. Then the distribution of X will become very complicated. Right? I don't want to deal with that. That's why I use conditioning everywhere. Because I need to write rates in terms of n, and n is a random variable. The reason is that my generative model is actually random. It will generate m comma n to be random. So I want a condition on the event that there are n treatment samples. Yes, it will create some complicated conditioning across many other things. But the most important thing is that you only look at x and you decide t. I mean, ignorability holds. So what will happen is you can write these effective statements such that the epsilon 1i and epsilon 0i are independent of t. Why is that? Because this is my generative model. Ignorability implies that uh, t is independent of epsilons, epsilon 0 comma epsilon 1, conditioned on x. Right? But what am I conditioning? I'm conditioning only on t's. They may depend on x, so they may affect x, but they can never affect the independence in epsilons. Yeah, right. Me putting somebody in one slot or the other will not change my epsilon one and epsilon two. It's very, very important. At least they will be independent. That's all that matters. Yes. What do you mean for all x Conditioning on the number of uh, treated people is some. So what is the expectation? No, the expectation is over the noise, right? So there is additional noise in the data as well. Yes. If x here is actually not taking like. It's not means per error, but like the uh, L infinity of like for all x. Yeah, 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 some L infinity version of uh, the square error. Yeah. See, there is an average version of this. It's just that it takes longer to prove. <laughs> so I'm just using the infinity versions because I just uh, make the point very clearly why there is one over m power n. That's the only thing. Yes, go ahead. Second and third equations should be exciting rather than epsilon i. Uh, okay, so you're asking that's why it depends on x i. It's a very complicated question. Uh, okay, whatever epsilon i depends on, this is true. That's all you need. Okay, uh, the easiest model is when this is independent of x. So let's assume that. Okay, uh, in fact, the only thing I need is you are right. So the expected value of epsilon given x is equal to zero. The expected value of epsilon square given x is equal to some sigma square, and epsilon i's are independent. And they remain independent even when I condition on t is equal to n. That's the only important part that you guys need to understand because of ignorability. Because ignorability says why whatever randomness is there over and above x is independent of the treatment. How does it matter whether you are summing, conditioning on any people are there or any people are there? The distribution of X, I mean, the epsilons will not change. That's the important part. Okay. At least they will remain independent. They will not be coupled. Because this is a coupling constraint, right? Like I'm taking M plus M samples, I'm saying these many people are treated. So that's a conditioning on the entire set of noise. But because of ignorability, you are safe. 
It's a very subtle point, but I'm just making it without a lot of cards. I mean, you can write all the maths and then show the same thing that I said. Yeah. yeah this is very interesting because you said like you're not making assumptions like uh, Gaussian distribution on noise. Nothing. Uh, well, um, we are going to use only expected uh, arguments in as wide errors. So you don't need any. Yeah, more right. Right. Sorry, what is the I, I subscript there? Like, I, I is the ith person. Yeah, yeah, ith individual. So, okay, let's say I get individual. But this is very subtle, but uh, I mean, once you see it, you, you get it. This follows some incompatibility. Now let me analyze this estimator straight, right? So uh, by the way, g is equal to zero. So I'm actually only estimating beta one hat. I'll drop the one. I'll just assume it as beta hat. Okay, and I want the error here. That's all I care about. Okay. So you will immediately see why the uh, error decomposes. There's one more subtle argument. Okay, that. So what do I want to prove? I want to say tau hat of x minus tau of x square conditioned on the fact that summation p is equal to m for all x. I want to prove that this is roughly scaling as 1 over m power 8 plus 1 over m. This is what I want to prove. Where tau hat is beta 1. Yes, tau hat is. Uh, of course, I have to assume something. <laughs> but more things I need to assume about the linear part. So remember, this regression is being done on the treated variables. Okay. So let's consider all the covariates of the treated. Sorry, one more. Yes. What is beta one hat? Beta one hat is tau hat, right? Uh, beta one hat times x is tau hat. It's a linear function. Okay, maybe I should. Uh, so tau hat is uh, beta hat. X times beta. Yeah. You the mu space. So I think one more is needed, which I erased. I think uh, y one minus y zero is uh, the expected value of this per per point is uh, x times beta. This is an assumption because I can make that around. Just saying there's a linear shift between these two functions. That's all. Beta one hat will also be a function of x. Yes, beta one hat will be a function of all the x's in the tree. I'm saying if you give me a new point, I'll take beta beta hat and then multiply by x. But beta hat itself is an explicit function of all the treatment points. I'm going to talk about it. That's precisely what I'm talking now let's take the targets. It's a regression problem. Let's take the targets. Targets themselves are substituted by some other regression. So you'll be very careful. So let's take the targets. Let's call the targets as D1. Okay. So this is Y1 minus mu hat of X. Now this can be written as Y1 minus mu hat mu zero of X plus you know the usual uh, decomposition. Now, y1 is form basically. So, yes, y1 So, this, uh, okay, uh, let me be careful here. So, this would be mu1 of x minus mu0 of x. The difference, the true difference that I really care about, uh, plus epsilon i. Here I won't put one because all of them are one. Okay, everybody is in the data treated group. Okay, plus this difference. Let me call this delta. 
Okay, now very important. Epsilon I is a natural noise in my system. Delta I is the regression noise that I got from my previous regression. Right? What do I know about that? The only thing I know is this guy. The first step over all other variation is the expected value of that error per point is 1 over x over That's the only thing I know. That's the only assumption I've made, and that's the only thing I know about delta I. But the crucial part is that epsilon i and delta i are independent. Why is that? They are coming from two different groups. So I already said just because you separated the group, the noise won't depend on anything. It is unconditioned. Therefore, uh, you did some regression, so you got some regression noise. This is epsilon i, which is the true noise in my data. But it is from a different group. So, uh, so because they come from because they come from different groups. Epsilon I is independent of beta. Okay. That's the main main point. From here, everything follows. <laughs> what am I going to say for those? So this is nothing but beta transpose X plus epsilon I plus delta I. Okay. It is like you have a normal regression problem, a linear regression problem, but with two noise terms, one that came naturally, which is sigma squared, the other already that is scaling as one over n power a, roughly speaking. I am not claiming that uh, delta i's over i are independent. I am only claiming that delta i's and epsilon i's are independent. Okay. Do not x minus. Yeah, the second line is u naught minus u naught. The second line. The second line is. Uh, that is the line before. Yeah. Where it should be u naught minus u naught. U naught. No, I just added and subtracted both. Okay, okay, okay. Sorry. Uh, defining delta as the that difference. And I know that the uh, per point that is. Okay. Uh, basically, it's a linear regression problem with uh, one vector being independent, even across points, uh, the other vector being independent of this, this particular one. So, question is, what is the error scaling like? Right? Uh, again, I won't go into the full details. I'll just give you the rough idea. If you want, you can go to the paper and look at each one of those uh, expressions. Uh, now, it's just a question of just bounding singular values of the treatment matrix, the covariate matrix. That's it. So let me do that. Yes. Uh, so epsilon i is our IID across i. Huh. But delta i you're saying is not. Yes. Why? Why? Because I've come back to Estimate. But this is this your other group. That should be independent. No, but I never said oh, by doing some neural net and all of them. Taking some something. So you are already correlated with all of this. But the main point is that whatever the case is that's that's uh, per point bounded in the L2 map, so many told you. The other thing is that it is independent of this epsilon i because it's from a different. What is delta i? I think it's completely delta, right? Because u naught x does not depend on the individual, and u naught hat x also does not depend on the individual. It's an estimator that has been found by you know combining. No, no I meant uh, yeah, yeah, delta, right? So there is no delta i. No, but it varies with x respect to x, right? So i. Uh, like uh, the individual is also having delta it. Is there, okay, delta. Yeah. That is, that. Is, is that clear? Or you, it's not clear to you. So for me, delta of x is x equal to small x is different from uh, x equal to small x1 should be independent of delta of x equal to small x1. No, why? Because my regression was done on all the data. 
So all these vectors are correlated. I don't know. I can't like can't like uh, I can't write that. Have a regressor. Huh? Did you have a noise? The regressor was trained on the same data. That's what I'm trying to say. Right, right. And yet you have a noise over that regressor to the actual value. Yeah, because actual values get you just regressed it yes. uh, because this was re regression done on the model uh, y0 of x is equal to uh, mu0 of x plus some extra noise. You remember? Yes. Yes. Uh, right. Now, this was a vector, regress. this was a d squares regression. Yes. I have one function here, right? Uh, maybe you fit a neural net, I don't know. Lipschitz neural net, for example. So, all the noise would be so when I take for the same x, when I keep taking the difference between the true one minus the estimate. I will couple all the noises, right? I can't I can't say anything about it. It's not needed. Yeah. At the point where you're saying tau hat minus tau whole square, that expectation is just epsilon i plus delta plus square difference. Uh, no, uh, this is the one I want to here. Do not have is one word. So this you said the expectation is essentially epsilon i plus delta. It's some uh, linear combination of epsilon i and delta. That's what they talk because uh, you are also doing least squares estimation. So beta hat. Okay. So now I make it very clear. So beta hat is uh, x one transpose x one inverse x one transpose d one. So d one are the targets. Right. Uh, and uh, you, 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 this is least cost estimation. The covariates of the treatment, they call the X1, this matrix. And this matrix is basically uh, there are n treated people, d dimensions. Just want to make sure everything is fine. So let me check. This is D, this is X, D. This checks out. Uh, is uh, post so this will be n cross one this is d cross one so everything checks out finally we get d cross one and that's what i want just uh dimensionality matching yeah. yes i think uh assumption is in this data otherwise it's not in mm -hmm. D cross N, N cross D. This whole matrix only I want to in invert. So as long as you have linearly independent uh, uh, columns or rows, you are fine. If N is less than D, then it will be a rank. Ha uh ha, -huh, yes, yeah, N has to be very less. Yeah, correct. Usually, yeah. Maybe rank deficient, you are right. Uh, so, yeah, you need N to be less. Sorry. Okay, so now uh, the point is uh, this expression is nothing expected by x square post times beta beta square. This is what I want. Okay. So all you need to do is just substitute for beta, substitute for beta half, do all. Ultimately, what will uh, this guy will get cancelled? Why? Because you already have beta transpose uh, x, uh, b has beta transpose x, uh, this will be inverted essentially. So, b is the only thing that will remain that b will get cancelled. So, the only two terms that will remain are epsilon and epsilon. So, you just get this giant uh, quadratic expression for these, for these two. So you will actually get uh, the expected value of x1 transpose x1 inverse x1 transpose epsilon i square because they are independent. I find out there will be no correlation. You will get there is an external x square here. Do not confuse this x with this. This is training data. This is some target point. Okay, very important. 
So plus, um, you will get an identical expression here. This is x1 equals x1 uh, inverse. Again, x1 transpose delta square. OK? Clear? Now, this is just normal least squares. If you have beta transpose x plus epsilon, this is what you would do. Uh, I skipped the uh, like when it uh, when it uh, in what is the statistical rate and all that. The main condition you need is uh, the lambda min of x transpose x to be greater than a constant. That's the main condition you need. Uh, okay, x one transpose x one is a constant. Okay, uh, the expected value is fine actually. You don't need uh, you don't need it to be per point. So lambda x one so actually you, you need. So for the given data matrix, lambda min of x1 transpose x1 is greater than a constant. When it's uh, lower bounded, the condition numbers are really good. Essentially, what you can do is you can actually show that this scales as sigma squared because that's a noise here. Then you will get dimension uh, multiplied by lambda min divided by n. You will write this parametrically. There's nothing complicated for new here. This is just least squares regression. You just have to evaluate this. Basically, you write this as trace of uh, x uh, inverse, inverse again, x, epsilon, epsilon transpose, epsilon, epsilon transpose is sigma square from the identity, sigma squares comes out. Then you get another quadratic expression. Again, put the trace formula. You will cancel one inverse and you'll be left with one more. And uh, that's a trace of some invert, inversion of some matrix. And that can be related up to dimension to lambda min of that matrix. Actually, Lambda min inverse of the matrix because there will be lambda max and will be lambda min inverse. Okay, so this is taken care of. I'm not writing the whole stuff, uh, but uh, if you want very quickly, all I'm trying to do is you have epsilon transpose uh, x1, x1 transpose x1 inverse, x1 transpose x1 inverse. It will repeat twice, and then you will get x1, and then you will get epsilon. So the first, so this will be the norm. Right. So this this is what we want to actually estimate. This would be the square error. This can be written as trace of uh, you know you put this in for x1 blah blah x1 uh, transpose times trace of epsilon 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 transpose. Right. So you can write it basically like this. Okay. Um, yeah. So epsilon epsilon transpose sigma square times identity. So sigma square comes out. So you'll have trace of x1 blah x1 transpose. Again, you write it as sigma square times trace of x1 x1 transpose times the blah. And the blah has two inverses. So one inverse gets cancelled. So you get trace of the inverse of this matrix. That's the sum of eigenvalues. So that will be d times the largest eigenvalue. Put that in and then put it. There's a one over n. The reason is that uh, Usually, what people assume in linear regression is why the n is greater than constant. Because this will be ordered. If there are n points, my singular value keeps growing. Right? So you need to normalize by n, and then you have to assume that singular value is a constant. This is an approximation to the covariance. Right? You want to assume that the covariance is basically the lambda of the covariance is greater than or equal to constant. That's why you need a 1 over n, and that 1 over n is appearing. Okay? So this is these squares. Okay. Let's go here. Exactly same identical manipulation, uh, only that here in this step there is delta square. So there is a, there, there will be a delta square here. So you can't do anything to it. So uh, you just apply the generalized eigenvalue. Generalized eigenvalue theorem says that whenever you have the form, okay, let me actually work it out there instead of being saying all this. So this is the first term. So this gives the first term. Now I have to work out the second term, right? The second term will look as follows. So the second term is again delta transpose uh, x1 blah, the same blah, times x1 transpose times delta. Right? Now this is some generalized eigenvalue theorem. The generalized eigenvalue theorem says this is actually less than or equal to. Uh, lambda max of x1 x1 transpose 
by lambda min of dubla. But dubla has two replicas of x1 transpose x1 transpose actually. So you'll be getting a square. So you'll essentially get this is lambda max of the same x1 x1 transpose divided by lambda min square by x1 x1 transpose. Now you just assume this is bounded. And that's the assumption they make. <laughs> so you just assume that this is bounded. This is some very general version, some condition number equivalent. I'm not saying it is condition number. I know there's a lambda min square. You just assume that this is a constant. Uh, then you can prove. So there's only the only thing that will remain is multiplied by delta square. We know now that delta square is bounded by one over m power a. That's what we basically say. So if you do all of that, you will actually get one over m power a times these condition numbers, lambda max by lambda. Okay, so that's it. So what I've shown is that if the condition numbers of these x1 transpose x matrices are really good, which is usually what everybody assumes in least squares regression, you will get one over x ray, you will get one over m power a rate. Okay. That's it. It's, it's not very complicated. It's just the ignorability says that delta and i epsilons we can bigger can become independent. That's the key observation. Once you make the observation, this is just routine math. Now, there is an expected variant of this. Suppose you don't assume error per point, but you only assume mean expectation. You need to take an outside expectation and just go through this a bit more carefully, and that's it. Uh, that's all there in that paper. Okay. Um, now, for different kinds of estimators, so I haven't told you what estimator I used for mu naught of x. I only said that I did the second one using least square regression. That's the only thing I said, right? So the first one could be substituted by any base learner you want. XG boost, whatever it is, whatever parameter rate that gets, then we get substituted. That's it. Okay. So this is um, meta learners. Uh, it's a very important part of uh, how do you do individual treatment effect estimation. The main non-trivial part is uh, if one of them is small, the other is very big, and if one of them you are estimating a very complicated function, uh, use the complicated function estimation on the group that has a lot of data. Then uh, form your D matrix, sorry, D vector, which is the targets, which is the difference. Then do the simple uh, regression estimate. So you will actually get the best of it. Okay. I mean, there's no magic here. I mean, you have to pay for 1 over n and 1 over m power a. So that's why there's no magic here. Uh, but the main point is if this was large, you could pay. That's all this is. Saying. Yes. The second expression, uh, one by m power a is coming from the delta square. Yeah, that is. But in the first case, it's coming from lambda. No, this is normal least square simple regression. Epsilon i uh, trace is uh, identity times sigma square because it's uh, it's an uh, independent covariance matrix. We know that. Sigma square by no, this will be an identity times sigma square. So if you look at the trace formula, it's trace of this times epsilon epsilon transpose. Yes, but, but what I was saying was the more data points you have, your noise estimate is less. Yeah, that will uh, happen when you yeah, but that will happen when you divide by n and understand that this lambda min is on the sample covariance matrix because this is full covariance matrix without any normalization because there are two inverses. One inverse will survive. So when you do one over n, you have to again take one over n outside. So that's what gives the one. Here, samples are averaged. As though you're doing mean estimation. But condition number you have to pick. That's known. That's known to be known. Here, it's a very complicated regression. You don't even get one over m. You get one over n power a. But it's okay. You can get that addition. That's what it is. Uh, this is there in the meta learners paper. Go to the appendix. All this is worked out. Much more grander detail. Uh, and there are many, many assumptions and there are many, many uh, like results that they have. But this is the key point. Okay. okay, I thought I would cover one more <laughs> estimator between one and a half hours, but I couldn't. But it's okay. But I'll say what the estimator is. It's very important. Uh, and it connects to some uh, interesting area in, 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 in machine learning. Uh, and it has spawned a very interesting set of words because I also want to state some open problems. Right? Uh, so, by the way, uh, trying to improve. So, there are some minimax uh, rates that are available in that paper for any tau hack estimate. Uh, the question is, what sort of estimator can actually achieve that? 
uh, those kinds of problems, uh, there are some open questions. You can actually take a look at the paper. Uh, but I'm going to talk about what is the gap between the lower form and the upper form? Is there some non trivial gap? Or yes, there is a non trivial gap. I uh, don't remember what it is. What is the current? So, the thing that I know is uh, unconditionally, if you have just Lipschitz uh, assumption on mu, mu naught, uh, there is some rate that you can get. That's some A max rate that's available. That can be exactly matched if you used K N N estimators for mu hat. And uh, this one, assuming linear, then this will match. But there's only a very specific case. If you have some other assumption on mu, I don't know. Yeah. So K N N is mostly a theoretical thing. I mean, it's only in very, very huge dimensions, it actually gives some non trivial rates. Uh, but turns out that if you use KNNs appropriately with these kinds of estimators, you would get something not clear. Oh, yeah, at least the minimax rates are concerned. Now, let me actually go to uh, what is called TARnet. Uh, I don't know why it is called TARnet. I will read the paper for it, but I can cite the paper. So it's by, so it's IDE, uh, let's say from New York. First paper to do so. Um, by Udi Shalit. Both the tables in these uh, papers, uh, essentially all the X learner, S learner, uh, with some um, XG boost and other kinds of estimators are compared with this new novel thing. Okay. Okay. This one uh, ties to demonstration in machine learning. So here you actually get some sort of an intersection between causal inference and domain allocation. All along, you would have already suspected that every single thing you knew about domain adaptation is already being indirectly used here. Important sampling. Important sampling is also a domain adaptation method. When you want to do unsupervised, we have unsupervised test samples. That's exactly what you do. You take the train. You would import and sample by the test probability, and then you would fit the loss, and you would actually use that to test. Right? So that motivates IPW type estimators. Okay. The one that I told you, yeah, this probably doesn't fit in any uh, one particular case. You can also do a more nuanced version of import and sampling by using kernel green matching. So th that also is another estimator that is available in the causality literature. So then the obvious question here is, what is the most general theme that emerges? Okay, that's the part that we have to understand here. So let's go back to ignorability. So y0, y1 is independent of t given x, and we assume that p of t given x is positive. This is what we have assumed. But in finite samples, if you have the sample using this, maybe p of t given t equals 1 given x, for any x is very, very small. Uh, right? It's positive, but it's very, very small, which basically means most of your samples are going to be very skewed. Like most of them will be control or only very few samples will be treated. So it's a very strong. Yeah. No, suppose, uh, yeah, that is too true. Uh, but suppose I also tell you that uh, P of uh, T is equal to, I mean, I'm not telling how I'm generating it. But I'm saying that after the data, is after the fact, I'm assuming I'm, I'm seeing this joint distribution. Then it means P of X given T, uh, T is equal to 1, P of X given T is equal to 0, will be very, very different. Because the way people usually do is they collect some census survey, they say, oh, I have to assemble enough number of control people, okay, so I'll assume I'll just bring them here. Oh, I need enough number of treated people, okay, I'll just get the data from them and put it here. So there's only an effective distribution you can talk about, there's nothing more you can say. But the one important thing is that once you put uh, if the number of treated and uh, untreated are equalized, you might think there's no problem. But there's a big, there's a different problem. The problem is that for finite number of samples, some uh, particular thing will go only in one of the groups. Some particular excess will go in the other. Yes. Some sort of weighted gradients. Uh, yeah, so weighting is the kernel mean matching method, which I'm not going to talk about because I can keep talking about all the domain allocation methods and how they get adapted here. Uh, but I'm going straight into a neural network. That's much uh, easier to do. I give the architecture now, uh, and then I continue some proofs maybe in the next uh, class. But next class, mostly I'll wrap up potential outcomes, hopefully, with the uh, instrumental variables.
That's one last thing I wanted to say, but uh, somehow the pace has been very slow. I apologize for that. Uh, then I'll jump into the third year uh, stuff. So let me actually give you the architecture for this. Uh, now, what is the main problem? The main problem is in practice, the control will look like this, the treatment will look like this. Okay. You are doing regression based on this X. You are doing regression based on that X. Clearly, there's an extrapolation problem. So, for example, uh, in this region, right? Then you can't say anything about, let's say this was zero, uh, this was one. You can't say anything about mu hat not, right? You, you cannot say anything about mu hat zero. Again, similarly in this region, you can't say anything about mu hat one. So practically speaking, although all these consistency results will hold in large number of samples, there is an actual issue. Okay. So what they said was, okay, let's observe the ignorability condition. It's a very simple but a very very important insight. What they said was, okay, I'll call x one. As the data coming from the other distribution, p of x given t is equal to 1. x0 as p of x given t is equal to 0. These two distributions are different because this is different. Okay, now what I'll do, uh, I'll make a very simple observation. I'll say if I get two distributions, I can always transform them such that in the transformed space, they can actually match each other very well. Okay. Suppose I can find a fee which is one to one. Okay. Uh, and uh, 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 such that the probability of uh, phi of x given t is equal to zero is equal to probability of p of x given t is equal to one. Then my life is very good. Why? Because I have essentially simulated a random x experiment. Because p of t given x is half. If they both overlap. P of T given X is half. But then you might ask, you might ask I know ignorability satisfied only on the X. How what how do I know what do I know about C? Because P is one to one, right? Uh, from its range, it is invertible. Right? Therefore, uh, ign this ignorability also carries forward. We will assume price differentiable continuous and all that, but that's the secondary thing. The main thing is P is one to one. So if you use a one to one transformation to go into some space, maybe then you can bring them together better. Right? And therefore, but this condition will still be satisfied because of one to one. Yes. So are you going to use a regularizer on? Yeah, <laughs> we'll go But it's, uh, you said from its range, it's invertible. I, I don't agree with that. So if it's one to one, you might go into some embedding space and from every embedding point, you may not be able to go. So you can, right? Because it's one to one. Yeah. So for every point in X, you find. So I go here. I'm only six. So there are only two things, right? Like uh, this is almost, uh, I mean, it's a bijection up to the on-to-ness. On-to-ness is not there, which means uh, the range could be very big. But this guy goes here, but there's a one to one map. So if you give me this point, I can always come back. But if I give you some other point, one to one price. One to one means for this for target point, there's only one uh, one in the domain. Right, but if I give you some some point in the range outside, huh? What I can't do, but that's okay. But this p function is one to one. Therefore, there should only be one one thing before. So you can say okay, it doesn't go back to anything. That's okay, but that's fine. Okay, but there's an inverse function. The inverse function may not have this as the domain. That is true. That could happen. But this is one to one. But ignorability does not get uh, violated. Why? Because if I condition on P of X, I can uniquely go back to the particular X. Therefore, uh, this conditioning is equivalent to this particular conditioning. Uh, so I'm basically good. So now what I've done is that by moving, uh, by transforming distributions, I have actually solved the overlap problem a little bit. Okay. So then the question is. Uh, okay, if they're not exact, but they're approximately close, uh, what can you say about the error? Okay. Uh, so what their paper proves is that, uh, okay, I'm going to say it in a very rough way, and uh, I'll state formally what the uh, result is next time. I may or may not prove it. It's just a matter of uh, going, I mean, carefully tracking all the Lipschitz constants. That's all it is. So, 
The problem I solved with this transformation is that. Thus, P of X is an ignorable set of variables that compare with X. But I, by this theorem, on the fact that uh, the treatment and control are equally sampled, uh, it essentially means that P of T given P of X is exactly equal to half. Because you can simultaneously have this and this, but not have half here, basically. Okay, so this uh, plus P of T is equal to half implies P of T given P of X is actually equal to half. Propensity equal to half is the best thing you can happen to Because the eight estimator will not even have any variance. It will just be dividing by one over two. This is the best thing that can happen to so, so already you can see that there is no important sampling variance. If I, if I could manage to do this, of course, how to do that is a different story. Right? Did you say that P of T given X is small, and P of T given Phi of X is half. half? If this is true, if you manage to achieve this, then this is true. I'm not claiming you can do all this. I'm only saying that if you can manage to achieve this, you can do it. And by the way, in a single dimension, you can always shape any uniform variable into anything. So when I give two target distributions, I can take the uniform variable and I can go to two different distributions. So it's not like any magic uh, that is happening uh, in the sense that it's possible. Uh, so I can map all these two distributions by the inverse area function to the same uniform distribution. And that will look as though I have done, I have transformed X, okay, but that's okay. But I can regress because uh, ignorability is there for me. That will save me in all my regression problems. So I just give the, you know, I know I am going five minutes over time. Just two more minutes, I'll say what this implies in terms of a neural architecture. That's what they do. And there's some theory around it, and I will go through it in the next class. Okay. Um, but is it clear? The point is the point clear. As you can see, in all the results, ignorability is very powerful. <laughs> Without ignorability, I almost can't jump from anything to anything. Right? Uh, once you make that assumption, all these things follow, essentially. The epsilon being independent of delta, uh, that being a regression problem, you basically going to the control and regressing and then substituting here, all of that is enabled only because of ignorability. So what this that tries to do in that okay, but you have to make sure that ignorability is not lost. So here is the neural net thing. So what you do is you take X, okay? You pass it through a neural net. You produce P of X. Okay? Then you take the treatment, right? Then what you do is you basically split it into two. You have one neural net H1, another neural net H0. This actually tries to predict Y1 and this tries to predict Y2. So all I have done is swan, used uh, it in the treatment, so like the previous uh, thing that I said. You try to escape it one. Okay, then you can use the consistent notation. U1. Of X and mu zero hat of X. In fact, uh, let me just say that it is mu one times P of X. Because P is a common transformation. Okay, so this part, this is the mu one hand function, this is the mu zero hat function. Okay. Now I have to impose the fact that C is sort of one to one. Don't ask me which neural net is one to one. Uh, so there are invertible neural nets, there are all kinds of neural nets that are there. So you want to make sure that this is one-to-one -one of some sort. So you can go to any target uh, range and you can regress, okay? But what do I need to make sure? I need to make sure that these two distributions sort of match. Of course, uh, I have to use some approximate distance. So what I do here is that, uh, so I, uh, so there are, uh, so there are two fees, right? So you take them. And you have an integral probability metric. Um, let's uh, say this is uh, 
uh, some sort of uh, so the integral probability matrix is the following. So over a function class, the expected value of uh, is equal to 0 minus okay, t equal to 0 right here. Okay. t is equal to 1 of p of If f comes from KHS, this is empty. If f comes from Lipschitz functions, this is last of t1. Okay. Uh, maybe gazillion APM, so depending on what you are uh, looking at. If there is a space of classifiers, this is total relation, right? So what I'm trying to do is I'm using witness functions. I'm considering p of x. So what you will get from here is p of x for treatment zero, uh, p of x for treatment equals one. So there are two different distributions. I want to bring them together. So I'm basically creating a discriminator right here. And this will be my loss. Don't ask how I compute all of this. I think it's very similar to CAM, right? And I just do gradients. So I fix p. I I I maximize this. I get a witness. Then, with respect to that witness, I do back propagation for p and back propagation for both h and okay. And the details are there in that paper. I D individual treatment effect by Shalit uh, Johansson and Sontag. I think it was ICML 2017 or 18. I don't remember. Uh, you can go and look at it. The diagram is also there. But the main point here is that uh, it's almost like a GAN type thing. Okay, yeah. You have to have an alternating minimization strategy. To get yeah, yeah, F yeah. F Nobody knows uh, any convergence results in this space. Uh, I, mean, I mean, there are convergence results for GANs also, but what I'm trying to say is, apart from that, there's nothing known very specifically for this particular argument. Because uh, when you have, uh, you fix the fee and then you can find the F. Correct. Then you fix an F, you can find the fee. Yeah. Then no, find this. Fix an F, you find the fee, and it Which is uh, over and three. Okay. So one of the main open problems is the following. Okay, if you make this one to one, sure, you can get some uh, bounds, uh, but nothing theoretical is known that would actually converge. Okay. So what's more important is that, uh, by the way, this one. Uh, is exactly domain adaptation. In domain adaptation, you have training data, you have test data. You will transform both to go to a common domain so that they overlap. And then you will do classification on one of them. Here you do classification on both because you are interested in the difference. That's the only difference. But otherwise, it's exactly unsupervised domain adaptation. So it's basically inspired by unsupervised domain adaptation. Important sampling was inspired by important sampling in domain adaptation. This was inspired by unsupervised uh, domain adaptation. So the obvious next question is, can you transport any domain adaptation technique and be happy with it? The main problem here is, usually when you do neural nets, you don't constrain this. Uh, it's not possible to make sure this is one to one. Okay, that's the main problem. Okay. So the question obviously is, can you transform this? But uh, let's say you even lose some data. Right? So you extra so much information, you even lose information. But still, can you actually get a transformation such that uh, you you satisfy ignorant grade? This is a very important open question. This is one specific case uh, that we have done uh, with my collaborators, where what we can show is IRM problem is exactly equivalent to this under some conditions. In IRM, if you think about it, if you knew what invariant risk minimization is, you take X, you go to some fee, but there's no invertibility in anything of that sort. Uh, and such that the regression function on top of it remains invariant. You can show that uh, this condition can be in some cases reducible to IRM, for example. But there you don't need one to oneness, there you don't need it. But if you want to apply domain adaptation, you need to make sure this, this network is one to one somehow, either architecturally or anything of that sort. So blindly using UDA is not okay. You don't need it to be one to one for the entire domain, but just for the data point. Uh, but you will always test on some other point, right? Like uh, the whole point of doing an IT function is that when a new patient comes, I need to know what the patient's uh, treatment. 
So I'll end here. Next class, I will show that uh, there is a loss function uh, here and there's a loss function here. Uh, the total counterfactual loss, the actual counterfactual loss will be sort of the sum of both. That's what they prove in their paper. I'll just show it. But the key assumption is that one to one. Because just because, so because you shouldn't start with a nice case and end up confounding the problem, <laughs> right? So in domain adaptation, that's not an issue. Because so domain adaptation is about a different issue. Because you have to preserve ignorability. Again, coming back to the central thing, ignorability, uh, you need to have to impose some other constraint on it. That's the basic message. Talk here. That is why when is the next one?